Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Is Agile cheaper? Is Agile cheaper? This is one in a series of webinars we want run on a regular basis, roughly every two weeks or so throughout the year. Um, and this one's received a very high level of, uh, of registration. People are very interested in, in hearing about this topic. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available later for those who could not attend. Um, your, your webcams and things are not being shared. The only way um, you, your privacy or personal information would be shared is if you choose to uh, speak up. You're currently all forcibly muted. If you'd like to speak, you can click the raised hand icon when we get to the Q&A session at the end. And I'll, uh, you can either type in your question or I can unmute your line and you can choose to uh, ask your question verbally. Okay, so I'm uh, Kevin Aguano. I'll be your host for today. Um, I've been in the project management world for over 30 years. I've done all kinds of work on all kinds of projects from everything from business process change, IT, construction and engineering, uh, high tech manufacturing, um, charities, governments, private sector, across the board. I've done tons of different project work across all different industries. Uh, I've written over 30 books on project management related topics. I have oodles of certifications. I teach as an adjunct professor at a few different universities. And um, I've, uh, if you want to find out more about me, just check out the link at the bottom of the page, procept.com slash team slash Kevin dash Aguano. Take advantage of me while I'm here on the call. Ask lots of questions and get the most you can out of this presentation. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions till the end. There is something called the questions window on the web interface. You can type your questions into there and I will address them later on in the presentation when we get to the Q&A part. But you can just type them in there as we go so you don't lose track of them or forget them. For those of you listening to this recording later on, I apologize. You won't be able to ask me live questions. Uh, but next time, keep your eyes open for the live events and you can sign up. So our agenda for today, I'm going to talk about first, why do we care about costs, right? Especially related to Agile. Why is there a, a concern about costs on Agile projects? How does Agile change how the costs of a project are uh, accumulated? Are there other financial impacts other than costs that we can get from Agile and Agile benefits and how they're tied to different levels of Agile maturity? So that's the, uh, the agenda for today's presentation. If you ask a group of individuals what benefits they expect to achieve by adopting Agile methods, you'll usually hear faster delivery, uh, higher quality, cheaper, and lower risk. And out of these, faster is the most common. While Agile does allow a team to deliver a solution in phases, which means earlier delivery of value, the overall project may not get completed much faster, at least not until one reaches higher levels of Agile maturity. Other Agile benefits are easier to achieve at lower levels of maturity, including higher quality due to continuous testing, uh, lower risk due to prototyping early to test risky design or technical assumptions. Um, faster delivery can be elusive as it requires many other practices to be well established for the project team before they can experience overall project time scale compression. The benefit of cheaper is similar in that it requires higher levels of agile maturity to realize it. In the 2008 Agile Adoption Survey published in the August 2008 edition of Dr. Dobbs Journal, researcher Scott Ambler noted that respondent data show that cost savings under Agile are not guaranteed. Respondents were asked if they did two identical projects, one Agile and one Waterfall, would the costs between the two projects differ? The results, as you can see, clearly show that Agile is not necessarily a cheaper approach but nor is it necessarily a more expensive approach. The answer is actually quite complex. Ambler's Agile Adoption Survey results may be somewhat deceiving also. Um, the, the, the survey assumes that Waterfall and Agile attempts are building the exact same deliverables. Through closer working relationships with business sponsors throughout the project lifecycle, Agile projects are actually better able to adapt to changing business needs 
resulting in deliverables no longer needed not being built later in the project and replacing them with deliverables that may have a higher business value. In other words, due to its, in a, it, due to its ability to flexibly and efficiently adapt to changes, Agile projects are more likely to build a set of deliverables closer to what the business actually needs. So a side-by-side -side comparison is difficult, if even possible. Yet, some teams are able to effectively deliver Agile projects that are consistently cheaper. How is this possible? Let's compare an Agile project and a waterfall project building the same deliverables. The outputs will be exactly the same for this example. The only difference will be in the process of how the deliverables were created, not what was created. How would the cost differ between the two projects? Well, let's start with project management. The work efforts of the project manager or scrum master would be higher on the agile project than the waterfall project. The project manager would have to organize and manage the frequent end of iteration demos of work in progress, lessons learned and iteration planning of an agile project that would not be required in a waterfall project. Add to that the running of the daily scrum meetings and daily preparation of burn down charts and, and you can easily see that an agile project usually requires more project management time than a waterfall project. Now recall this is then a waterfall project that is also in a high change environment. A project manager is quite busy on a waterfall project that has lots of change, just as they are on an agile project. It's just the agile processes require additional project management time. Now let's look at business analysis. Since requirements are usually only loosely defined at the start of an agile project, someone, often but not exclusively a business analyst, needs to work with stakeholders to understand and capture requirements in some acceptable format for the designers and developers of the solution. In waterfall projects, we have detailed requirements up front for the entire project. However, in high change scenarios, such as in agile projects, we usually start with only a high level description of the requirements with the detailed requirements analysis happening just in time, a little ahead of the designers and developers. The total work of uncovering and capturing requirements in an agile project may take just as much effort as in a waterfall project. However, waterfall projects bear an added risk of rework as prepared detailed requirements definitions need to be revised as changes occur throughout the project. Agile projects avoid this risk by performing detailed requirements definitions just in time. So, Agile's business analysis efforts may be somewhat less than in waterfall through the avoidance of costly rework. Next is design. Engineering and design work is similar to business analysis work in that the same solution needs to be designed, so the raw design effort's about the same. What changes, however, is the savings when you take into account the rework that can be avoided in agile projects as detailed design work is completed just in time, avoiding ongoing and extensive design document updates. So overall, agile's design efforts may be also less than in waterfall. Next on our list is development. At first, you may believe that the cost of developing, developing or building the solution should be about the same between the two approaches. After all, you're building the same stuff. There are efficiencies, though, when you consider the work to investigate and resolve defects. In a waterfall project with testing and the resulting defects identified only near the end of the project, it may take a large effort to find the cause of a defect as the entire solution may need to be examined in detail. With agile projects, Building and testing throughout iterations, however, when testing is performed at the end of an iteration, the source of the defect should be easy to determine as you only need to examine the work that was completed up to that point in the project rather than in waterfall where you need to crawl through the entire solution design. Similarly, as defects are found sooner, the amount of potential rework required to resolve a defect is much less than in waterfall due to fixing the problem before more potentially erroneous work is performed. So, while the build work is about the same, the refining and polishing of the built deliverables will take much less time than in waterfall. And finally, we have quality assurance. Now, here's one activity where effort and costs actually increases significantly while using agile methods. In waterfall, we only test near the end of the project, after all the deliverables have been built. 
with Agile, we test throughout the project, each iteration, giving us more time to find and fix the defects. This leads to much higher quality, but at a cost. We have to account for all this extra testing and retesting activity. Agile projects spend a much higher portion of the project effort on quality assurance activities than in waterfall projects. As I mentioned, there are areas where costs increase for Agile projects, namely project management and quality assurance. There's also, however, com compensatory savings in business analysis, design, and development activities. In all cases, the savings are primarily due to the avoidance of costly rework. These savings are realized through the prioritized phased nature of performing activities in an iterative and incremental fashion. Modest savings in business analysis and design activities are easily achieved, but do not come close to compensating for the increased quality assurance costs. The potentially significant development effort savings often make up the bulk of the savings when calculating the overall cost benefit analysis for switching to an agile delivery approach. If you expect your team to have significant quality challenges during the project, then you will likely see a greater savings of costly rework by switching to an agile approach. Conversely, teams with reliably high quality in their deliverables will see most of their agile savings from the reduction in business analysis and design rework. So, agile projects have a different cost makeup that may significantly vary from project to project, making any comparison too complex to make in a single definitive statement. To illustrate some of this, let's take a look at the cost of change curve first published by Barry Bame in 1981 in a textbook called Software Engineering Economics. Bame looked at data collected from waterfall-based projects at defense contractor TRW and IBM in the 1970s. And he found that the cost of making a change increases as you move through the development life cycle from requirements gathering through design, coding, testing, and finally the launch of the software into production. He noted that for small, simple projects, the cost of a change could go up fourfold, but for large complex projects, the cost of a change could be over 100 times greater in production than at the start of the process. Let's examine this. Imagine a change made once a system is in production. It may have enormous impacts on end users and the business in general. If it's big enough, the change may cause you to throw out the system and start all over again. If the change is due to a defect, there may be lawsuits from impacted users, a drop in your company's share value, and the accompanying publicity nightmare. In this case, we would consider the costs of late feedback or change to be exceptionally high. Instead, if the change or defect was discovered earlier during the, say, the testing phase, the cost of responding to it would be much less because of the avoidance of lawsuits, reputation damage, et cetera. And this change would have been even cheaper to deal with still if we'd found out about it during design review. But typically, waterfall projects get the bulk of their feedback, defect notifications, and change requests late in the process when they have the greatest costs and disruption to the project. Many studies have confirmed this phenomenon over the years. Steve McConnell, in his book, Code Complete, commented on this, saying, in, and I'm quoting, in general, the principle is to find an error as close as possible to the time in which it was introduced. The longer the defect stays in the software food chain, the more damage it causes further down the chain. Since requirements are done first, requirements defects have the potential to be in the system longer and be more expensive. Defects inserted into the software in, um, upstream also tend to have broader effects than those inserted further downstream that also makes early defects more expensive. So he supports this concept. He goes on to say, studies over the last 25 years have proven conclusively that it pays to do things right the first time. Unnecessary changes are expensive. Researchers at Hewlett Packard, IBM, Hughes Aircraft, TRW, and other organizations have found that purging an error by the beginning of construction allows rework to be done 10 to 100 times less expensively than when it's done in the last part of the process during system tests or after release. Now, this is not just about defects, but about any type of change made to a system. This is one of the areas where Agile and Waterfall greatly differ. 
Agile approaches break the project into short iterations. The primary goal of each is to demonstrate the work in progress to interested parties so that feedback and changes can be identified earlier throughout the process. With regular feedback gathering sessions, changes are identified and reacted to much earlier and at a much reduced cost. Here's another version of BAME's cost of change curve with both waterfall and agile QA practices overlaid, courtesy of Scott Ambler. Note that the QA practices highlighted in red are the ones typically found on waterfall projects. But look at the ones in green. They're the agile QA practices. Note how early in the process they're getting feedback, including changes and defects. The agile practices get changes so much earlier that they often avoid costly rework. While this results in huge cost savings, it requires a much greater focus on testing. This ongoing and continuous testing greatly increases QA costs. As I said earlier, however, the increased QA costs are offset by the reduced design, development, and retesting costs from the lesser amount of rework. They don't always perfectly offset all of the QA costs, but it goes a long way towards putting Agile and Waterfall on a more even playing field from the cost perspective. Maybe this is why the pie chart I started out with showed that overall, most projects wouldn't see a big difference in overall costs whether they used Agile or Waterfall methods. One factor to note is that the cost curve changes. As I noted earlier, the work of a business analyst, for example, is mostly at the beginning of the project in the waterfall approach, but spreads out using an agile approach. Similar changes are seen in the work of testers who are mostly active towards the end of a waterfall project, but who are active throughout an agile project and even at an even higher average level of activity than in waterfall. All of this is to say that while the overall project costs may be similar between waterfall and agile projects, the costs per role are definitely different and the timing of those costs is different. So if you're using internal resources for some roles and outsourcing others, the cost differential between internal staff and outsourced contractors may skew the picture, making one model much cheaper than another. Here's one example that shows a significant cost difference between a waterfall and an agile approach. Circe Dynix is a US company that builds ERP systems for libraries and has done so for several decades. They are the leading supplier of such systems around the world with 23,000 academic, public, school, government, and corporate libraries in 70 countries and over 300 million users. Horizon is a client server application written in Java. Changes in customer demand required an architectural change and significant rewrite to be able to accommodate mobile devices instead of legacy green screen type terminal access. So in 2005, the project began using an outsourced vendor called Starsoft, who is very experienced using agile methods such as Scrum and extreme programming. This agile project became the most productive Java project ever documented publicly. The software was originally written using the waterfall approach. For this complex rewrite, the team came up with a strategy of trying to rewrite one module first to see how the new project compared with the waterfall approach used in the past. If a positive difference was seen, then the team would continue to rewrite the rest of the application using an agile approach. <clears throat> the pilot horizon module took 60 co-located developers nine months to complete. At 54,000 lines of Java code and using a complexity metric called function points, the team's productivity was calculated at 1.7 function points per developer per month using the waterfall method. With the pilot rewrite, a smaller team of four and a half people took 12 months to create nearly the same amount of code and function points, but because of the smaller team, their productivity was much greater at 17.8 function points per developer per month. This is more than a 1,000% improvement. So management decided to let them use Agile to rewrite the rest of the application. Now, despite a much larger team, 56 people versus only four and a half, and the larger team being distributed between US, Canada, and Russia versus the pilot team being co-located, 
the team was still able to show an incredibly improved performance over the original approach at 15.3 function points per developer per month, which is a 900% improvement. While this is admittedly the largest published productivity gain from using Agile, even if you only achieved 10% of the gain they saw, that would still be a 90% improvement over using Waterfall on your own projects. And for fun, I assigned an arbitrary figure of $100 per hour as a blended cost rate for both internal and contracted resources. And using that in this model, we would see that using Agile on the pilot alone saved the company nearly $7.5 million. So even though most projects probably won't see significant overall cost differences using Agile approaches, as you move up the Agile maturity curve and learn to hyper-optimize, you can see tremendous cost savings. So far, we've just been looking at overall project costs, but there are other financial benefits from using an Agile approach. When business incurs expenses in order to earn income, tax laws generally allow the business to deduct those expenses from any income earned, reducing the amount of income tax that's income that's subject to taxation. The categories of expenses that are eligible for deduction and the portion of the expenses that can be deducted vary from country to country, but the principle generally holds true. And yeah, I know there's a few countries that have no taxation. If your company's listed in one of those, then this benefit doesn't affect you. Now, there are several ways in which eligible expenses can be deducted as well. Generally, small eligible expenses can be deducted 100% in the year the expenses are earned. Larger expenses may be fully deductible in the first year or may have the deduction spread out over time using a variety of techniques. When the deduction of large expenses is spread out over time, we say the expenses have been capitalized. And then we use the technique of depreciation for tangible assets like computers, network infrastructure, buildings, furniture, etc or amortization for intangible assets like patents, licenses, and trademarks. Now I note that some countries such as Canada, the two terms are often used interchangeably, but there is a difference. Finally, the allowable rates of depreciation or amortization are often set out in laws and regulations and differ from country to country. As my father used to say, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Or in other words, it's, it's better to take advantage of an opportunity now rather than wait for a better moment in the future. In accounting, it's best usually to take your deductions as quickly as possible to immediately minimize taxes in the present. Often excess deductions causing tax losses can be rolled over to future and sometimes even past tax years. On longer projects, expenses get capitalized and generally cannot be deducted or amortized until the project is done or when it starts earning its intended business benefits. Waterfall projects are done at the end, and it's easy to determine when the benefits realization begins. However, on agile projects, deliverables are produced in a phased approach, and benefits realization may begin at many points along the project lifecycle. Which brings us to the question at hand. For agile projects, when can we start deducting or amortizing capital expenses? The answer, as I said earlier, depends on when business benefits start being realized. If you use an agile approach to produce your deliverables in a phased approach, but you don't start really using them until the end, then the deductions will start at the end once the deliverables are put into use as the intended business benefits as you'd, as you'd intended, which is how deductions are structured in waterfall projects. However, if you can put a portion of the deliverables into use early, where they start to earn incremental business benefits, then you can immediately start deducting the portion of the capital costs associated with those deliverables. And the difference can be significant. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say a company's starting a $10 million project to build a custom IT solution, integrating multiple backend systems to create a new customer self-service portal. The project is expected to take one and a half years to complete, and the Canadian Income Tax Act allows an annual deduction of this cumulative eligible capital at a rate not exceeding 7%. The rates are different from country to country, but in Canada it's 7%, which must be prorated if the solution is delivered mid-year. This means a deduction of $350,000 starting at the end of year two for a waterfall project. 
Now, the same project delivered in an agile fashion de um, deploys a functional and value earning increment of the solution every six months, for example, or three releases during the one and a half year project. Assuming costs are evenly distributed across the one and a half years and using the declining balance calculation method, the deduction would look quite different. For the Agile project, the cumulative total deducted by the end of year two is $699,184, compared with a total of only $350,000 for the Waterfall project. This shows that by switching to an Agile approach, the organization's business case would improve, showing an additional reduction of taxable income of you know, pretty close to $350,000 at a combined federal and provincial ta business tax rate in Ontario, Canada of 26.5%. This means a 92,534 net reduction in taxes over the two years just by switching to an agile approach. If the releases were more frequent, then the tax benefits would be even greater. Now, of course, the specific depreciation rates, calculation techniques, and tax rates will change over time and will differ between countries. However, the general premise would remain the same. Agile projects allow earlier deduction of capital expenses, which leads to tax savings over and above what would have been allowed for a waterfall project. And these benefits may make a meaningful difference when trying to get your project business case approved. Oh, and my lawyer informs me that I must include the following statement. I'm not a lawyer, an accountant, or a tax law expert. The information contained in this example is based on my own possibly flawed understanding of the relevant tax laws and regulations and should not be taken as legal or tax advice. You should consult your own advisors for details of how the principles discussed here may affect you and your own jurisdiction. <laughs> okay. And if you're a vendor of services to a client, using agile delivery approaches combined with a properly structured agile friendly contract means you can bill at the end of each iteration after each new set of functionality has been demonstrated, resulting in better cash flow. And cash flow is one of the most important factors to consider when assessing the health of a business. Now, some agile benefits are achievable right away, such as higher quality, lower technical or design risk, greater responsiveness to change and others. But using agile methods to cut costs, well, that's complicated. It is possible, definitely, but it normally only comes at higher levels of agile maturity. To get significant cost savings, you need the right iteration link that finds the right balance between efficiency and the cost of agile process overhead against the need for rapid feedback. You need the right number of releases of partial solutions to start capturing value sooner. Too long of a release cycle length means missed opportunities. You need a team that is gelled, that works together as a high performance machine, communicating continually and effectively with the right tools to get their jobs done. You need a governance structure that does not put unnecessary barriers on team productivity. And you need a client who clearly knows what he or she wants, who's decisive, and who is empowered to make those decisions. And that's all I've prepared today on the topic of whether Agile really is a cheaper approach. I'm available now to answer any questions you may have on the topic. You can type your questions in the questions window on the web interface, or if you want to ask your question verbally, just click your raised hand icon and I can unmute your line and you can uh, ask your question. Go ahead. And while we're waiting for people to type in their questions or raise their hands, I just want to remind you that we run these webinars every two weeks. Um, the next one will be coming up two weeks from now. Some of them are on agile, project management, leadership, change management, business analysis, entrepreneurialism, all kinds of interesting topics. I'm sure you'll find something in our schedule uh, that will interest you. So wherever you heard about this session, keep your eyes open for announcements about the upcoming sessions. Okay, I got a question from Hamid. Hamid is asking, is there a difference in costs between different agile methods like Scrum or extreme programming, et cetera? That's a great question, Hamid. Um, so 
um, off the top of my head, I would think that generally there may be some cost differences because some of these methods get more into um, specific practices around how you do the work. For example, Scrum is a project management framework. It talks about how we organize the project, how we organize and respond to change, but doesn't it specifically um, tell you how to do the work of building, designing and building the deliverables? That, that type of uh, prescriptiveness is not part of Scrum. However, other agile methods like extreme programming get very prescriptive. They include software engineering practices that uh, dictate how you do your programming work. Uh, so some Agile methods may have uh, different cost structures than others. Um, I've been speaking about Agile overall. Um, okay, uh, follow-up question from Hamid. Is there a best Agile method? Um, my response is the choice of Agile methods should vary based on your team's needs, the governance structure of your organization, available training, et cetera. Um, there are differences. For example, some Agile methods are more, um, uh, say, cultural, culture-based. They have less process. It's more about how the team works and interacts together. So it's about team building and openness and transparency. Others are more process-driven. There's specific steps and deliverables and, 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 and uh, process steps you're supposed to follow. Some Agile methods like Scrum really just address the construction phase of the project, the build phase, the do phase, where you're doing the work. They don't talk about planning, right? The, the, the Scrum methodology doesn't talk about coming up with a project budget and a high level project timeline. All that stuff is outside of Scrum. Neither does it talk about deployment and launching into the world. That's not part of Scrum either. Scrum doesn't give guidance on those, but other Agile methods cover more of that life cycle like feature-driven development or extreme programming cover you know, the, the do work that Scrum does, but it also includes some of the estimating and planning practices that come before Scrum starts. They, they include some techniques for building your upfront project plan. So they cover more of the life cycle. There are some that cover the full end-to-end -end life cycle. Uh, disciplined Agile Delivery, DAD, sometimes called. The Scaled Agile Framework for Enterprises, or SAFE. Uh, dynamic Systems Development Method, or DSDM. Open Up, the Open Unified Process. These all cover the end-to-end -end process. My favorite is the Agile PM technique. Um, again, that, com that covers the full end-to-end -end project life cycle. So uh, choose one that works best for your organization. But I tend to personally prefer the ones that are more disciplined and structured that cover the full life cycle. Okay, we have a question from Julio. It says, so we can say that in a large, in large terms, agile is most high than waterfall. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how to interpret that question. Is that a cost-related question? You're saying agile is higher costs? Costs, yeah. No, overall the costs are about the same. If I can refer you back to that slide I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Right at the very, very beginning, um, let me just go right back there real fast. Um, scoot right back to the beginning. There we go. Nope. Here, back to this slide here. In this slide, this study was done. It, it interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people from the Agile community and said, if you redid the project and it was waterfall instead of Agile, would it have affected the cost? The exact same project. And you'll see here that only 10% of people saw that there was any significant difference in costs, but it was five higher and five lower. So they kind of offset each other. 18% said the Agile project would be, would be a bit higher. 32% said the Agile project would be a bit lower. And 40% said there'd be no change at all. What this slide is telling me is that overall, at the big picture, Agile's probably not a big, there's not going to be a big cost difference on the average project. However, as I did discuss, um, if the team has high levels of Agile maturity and can take advantage, right, they're a high performance team, they're really gelled and working effectively together, and all of those factors I showed on my, my last slide, 
if the team is taking advantage of all of those items, uh, then they can achieve some significant cost savings. In fact, we saw an example with the Cersei Dynex system where the savings could be as much as 900 to 1,000%. Now, again, that's a, a crazy example, right? That's, that's the highest recorded um, uh, agile uh, return on investment, I guess, ever. Uh, but it does show you that it is quite possible um, to get those significant cost savings across an Agile project. Very good. Thank you for the question. Um, any other questions? Just type them in the chat window or the questions window, or you can click your raised hand icon, and uh, I can unmute your line. You can ask them verbally if you'd like. Uh, there's a comment. Somebody said they were very interested in that capital cost depreciation difference. That's quite innovative. They haven't seen anything like that before. Okay, thank you. I'm always playing around with different uh, ways of looking at Agile and Waterfall and comparing and seeing which one is, you know, are, are there differences on the business case? Are there differences in governance? How does it fit in regulatory environments? I'm I'm always looking at the contrast between the two and trying to figure out which is the right approach for a given situation. So I look at stuff like that. Excellent, any more questions? Okay, Th thank you, Anita, that's very kind of you. I appreciate the comment. Okay, so it looks like there's no more questions. Oh, there's, there's one more. Um, uh julio again says i don't know if that chart can be updated today it's for 2008 um yeah so this um this survey uh was was being done fairly regularly every couple years uh up until about 2012 or 14 but they asked somewhat different questions each year so they they issued the um uh, the survey each year, but they asked different questions. So we can't always compare year to year. Uh, it was in 2008 that they asked this question and, and around 2014 or so they stopped doing the survey. So I can't, uh, I, I don't have any more recent data than this, nor any other surveys that have asked this question. Okay, so thank you very much everybody for attending today's session. Uh, you can claim um, uh, you get three quarters of 0.75 of a PDU. If you are um, looking for professional development credits, you can claim 0.75 of a PDU. Um, and uh, again, keep your eyes open for future sessions that where we will uh, have additional topics that you might be interested in. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.